Saints for a touchdown! It's your inside pass to everything Saints football. And the kick is good! We'll take you to places most fans never go. Will Lutz from 60. To practice, to the sideline, to the locker room. Following every twist, turn, and touchdown of the Saints season. That is going to be a touchdown! Taysom Hill! Taste of TD. Welcome to Inside Black and Gold. And that is going to be a touchdown again. And guess who? Mike Thomas. Now, here are your hosts, Steve Geller and Jeff Nowak. <laughs> oh, baby. Welcome in to this special Monday morning edition of Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. I'm your host. First things first, I do want to apologize. I had initially intended to put this episode out on Friday, the normal publishing schedule, but everything got away from me. I've been filling in for Steve, who is back from vacation, so he will uh, join us on the rest of the podcast for the week and going forward, but I just ran out of time on the last day of mini camp, hosting, booking, all that, completely lost track of all of this, but I did want to come back and share a good bit of the conversation that I had with Charlie Long on Friday's episode of Sports Talk. I set aside an entire hour with the goal of kind of recording a de facto podcast that I could trim down and share, kind of like we did with the NFL Draft special. And we're going to get into a good bit. We're going to talk about the position battle that I see as being the most relevant and exciting to watch going into training camp. I was able to talk to Dennis Allen about that. Then we're going to talk more about the tight end position. I was able to get an exclusive interview with new tight ends coach Clancy Barone. Really interesting guy to talk to, so I'm excited to share that with y'all. We're going to talk about Jawan Johnson, a little bit more about Taysom Hill's role, who we were able to catch up with this week. And then in the final segment, I'm going to get into some of the quick takeaways that I wasn't able to share on last week's episode. It just works out this way because this is how the episode kind of sets up. That final segment will be kind of the news and notes and whatever from emptying out my notebook heading into training camp. I'll also hear from Jamal Williams talk a bit about the running back situation going into the full training camp, which is going to hit in late July. We don't have the exact dates on it yet, but we're going to have about a month and a half off to kind of reset, establish what we learned, get ready, anticipating what we'll have. I'm going to get into a roster projection that'll be updated later this week. But without further ado, here is that first segment of this special sports talk driven edition of inside black and gold thanks everyone who was patient thanks everyone who listened if you haven't subscribed yet please do that give us a rating give us a review wherever you get your podcast hit me up on twitter at jeff underscore noack without further ado here is the first segment of that conversation i was able to have on sports talk this week with charlie long enjoy we're going to go through a bunch of audio from saints camp going to ask a couple questions we're going to answer them we're going to hear an exclusive interview from saints tight ends coach Clancy Barone was able to catch up with him at minicamp this week. And so, Charlie, my question for you, what roster battles are you looking forward to this year at training camp? We got a little bit of a tease over the first over the three days at minicamp. We saw a couple practices at the three OTA sessions. I think there's still a lot of questions to answer, but I do think there's a few positions. So what are you looking at? I'm really looking forward to the back end of the wide receiver battle. Okay. I think I've already kind of talked about this a little bit. Like we know set in stone the top three guys was Shahid, Olave, and Thomas, but then outside of that, if you're carrying six, maybe even seven wide receivers, who's going to fill in those final four spots or three spots? Whether that be Brian Edwards, who obviously has a connection with Derek Carr from his time with the Raiders, a former third round pick. They signed um, Lynn Bowden just yesterday and Kiki Kuti as well, which I think we both kind of agree is probably more of a idea of maybe uses on special teams and return, as a return it's a returner guy. Play. Yeah. Right. Um, but I mean, Shahid was originally planned as a return guy as well, and he ended up being a very good receiver on top of that. So that, Traquan Smith, you know, just a couple of those players in the back end, A.T. Perry, who obviously hasn't gotten off to a great start um, as a six-round pick in OTAs and minicamp. I think the back end of the – what I'm actually looking most forward to in training camp is actually being able to see the lines play with pads and stuff like that because, you know, we haven't gotten much of that. And there's so much overhaul, specifically on the defensive line. But then the offensive line's also got their question marks with injuries. So watching the line play in training camp is going to be really cool. And I'm looking forward to it. But if you had to kind of narrow it down to a specific positional battle, I'd say the back half of the wide receivers for me. 
Yeah, the wide receiver room is always a little tough to gauge because we can, you know, there's a temptation to kind of tier it as if, okay, this is the top four and then that's five, six, seven, eight, except once you get down toward the back half, it's almost always going to be less about your wide receiver ability and more about how can you impact the game in other ways. It's the reason Trey right. Smith always makes this roster because even though he's not going to be involved in the passing game a ton when you have everyone available, when you have Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid, Mike Thomas, uh, he's still going to do other things. He's, he's notorious for doing the dirty work, like exactly. the run blocking and stuff exactly. like that. Notorious yeah, no. in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and... Whereas, you know, maybe a guy like A.T. Perry, I think he's a guy you want to keep on the roster, but you have to justify it in some way. And can he be enough on special teams? And so everyone wants to, like, we got into this with Emmanuel Butler, right? Everyone was wowed by his ability in camp, but it wasn't his pass catching ability that kept him off the roster. It was the other stuff. So that's kind of where it becomes a little confusing. And everyone's like, wow, but he was so good in these one on one reps. He caught all these catches and team drills. But that's not necessarily what we're looking at. So it does get a little complex. The position battle that I see as being a straight up 1v1, one of these guys is going to start, one of them is going to be the backup, is at the cornerback two position. And I was able to ask Dennis Allen about this, and we'll get into it a little bit more on the back end of this clip. And can you play that for us, Charlie? It looks like, you know, Adibo and Alante have kind of an alternating first team reps at the outside corner spot. Is that kind of the plan going to training yeah, camp? Look, yeah, we'll evaluate it as we go into training camp. But yeah, the, I mean, like I said, there's a ton of competition. Um, and, and, you know, playing time and starting jobs, those are all earned. And you got to really come out and earn it every single year. And so the great thing about it is I feel like those two particular players that you just mentioned, both of them are fully capable of being starters and playing at a high level for us. And so, uh, but we're going to let that, that competition play out. And that's very much going to be a straight up competition. And you can tell because of the way it's working right now. Paul Sinadibo took the reps, team reps with the ones on the first day of minicamp. Alante Taylor took the reps with the ones on day two. And then on day three, you had Alante Taylor getting the first team reps in the seven on seven drills and Paul Sinadibo getting the first team reps in the 11 on 11 drills. Alante Taylor has also been getting the third team reps in the slot. So I think you're kind of setting up for him to be the backup to Bradley Roby there one way or another. And then it's going to be a question of is it Paul Sinadibo starting on the outside or Alante Taylor? and if it was one ahead of the other you would have them taking the first team reps you alternate because it is neck and neck it could go either way and like Dennis Allen said I think they are comfortable with the fact that either could start and it's a question of who 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 wins that job so I think that's going to be a really fun one to watch yeah he straight up said that they're both starting level players right. like and starting caliber yeah I know so that's going to be as you said really fun to watch as well I think if you had to probably guess, I mean, go ahead, Jeff, make your assumption right now, like who wins that battle during training camp? Because I remember last year, Paulson Adiba was awesome in the offseason. He was great during training camp. Like I think Bobby has said a couple times, all airline drive, so to speak. Um, <laughs> but I, I, with Alanti in his, his rookie season, he was really impressive as well as the second round pick, a premium draft pick used on this guy. And he showed out in his rookie year as well. So that's going to be a really fun one to watch. I agree with you. But if you had to guess right now, who are you picking? Alante Taylor is going to be the starter on the outside one day. Is it going to be week one of the 2023 season? I don't know. I think he is the all-around better player in terms of upside, in terms of speed, in terms of recovery ability. I think there are still kind of facets of his game that he's fine-tuning. And I think there's a chance that Paulson Adebo is just a more safe play early in the season. They're both going to play. You need both of those guys one way or another. Like, you look at what happened last year. You ended up having to start Chris Harris. You ended the season thinking, man, we have all these guys. You have Bradley Roby, you have Alante Taylor, you have Paulson Adebo, you have Marshawn Lattimore. Halfway through the season, you had Alante Taylor and Chris Harris starting. I think it was against the Steelers, right? Like, that's not a situation you want to be in. So you're comfortable with one starting and one being the backup. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be Paulson. It's and, a good problem to have, yeah. <laughs> you know, either way. But, but I think you're going to rotate, okay. and I think you're going to find ways to get them all on the field. One other question that you're going to have is who plays the slot, you know, and I've been getting into this conversation with people on social media about they seem to think that whoever doesn't win that battle is going to be the slot corner. Mm. And I understand why, the idea that you want to get all th- your three best defensive backs on the field. But I also think this team knows that it was a much more cohesive defense when C.J. Gardner-Johnson was 
owning the slot. And I think whoever plays the slot this year, they want to have that player own that position. And right now that's Bradley Roby. And I don't think you're going to have Bradley Roby play nickel corner, slot corner, all training camp, which is going to be the case. And then suddenly at the last second say, well, you know, we're going to start this guy at the outside. So Alante, you're in the slot now. Like that's not what you want to do. Um, So I do think that Bradley Roby is going to be interesting to watch because last year you had that rotation. I don't think it worked. And I think you kind of settled later in the year on on your final kind of rotation there, and it was one guy. And I think that's what you're going to see this year. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I I kind of agree with that point that it's hard to just say, okay, if Alante beats out Paulson for that cornerback two spot on the opposite of Marshawn, that you can just kind of slide Paulson into the slide. I don't think it really works that way. I also don't think Paulson profiles that well. No, he doesn't. He he profiles better on the outside. Good enough. Yeah, I agree. And I do think he tackles well. That's that's kind of the weird thing is I don't know if either of those players are great man-to-man corners, and that's that's the strange part is this is a team that plays ex- almost exclusively man-to-man, man, man-to-man, man-to-man on the outside. And I do think that if you when you get down to it, Alante Taylor is going to be the better player. It's just a question of how well he performs in the first. Yeah, how long it's going to take. So a few to weeks speak. of camp, right? right. And, and we're not going to find out until joint practices, until preseason weeks one, two, and three. We do have a clip, if we have time to play it, of uh, Dennis Allen kind of talking about what he likes most about Alante Taylor. And I think this is what you really do notice when you talk to him. Demeanor, the way that he plays the game. Um, look, yesterday he got beat on the deep ball comes back the next time he's out there intercepts it to, to end the game in a two minute situation so uh, the moment's not too big for him um, he's highly competitive and uh, he's got a short term memory and, and you have to be able to have that uh, when you play corner in our league and this is a, what Alante Taylor had to say about that same moment Really, I kind of said it before, just I'm going to win more than I lose. Um, at the time when it happened, you know, I was kind of beating myself up a little bit. Uh, but when I came to the sideline, Roby and Marshawn was kind of telling me, like, it happens, right? And reminding me that it happens. And uh, it was telling me, like, it's all about how you bounce back. And so whenever I went in and played the nickel, uh, my mentality at that point was just make a play, too. Like, I don't know how I was going to make a play, but the plan was, like, to make a play. And opportunity came, and I took advantage of it. And I just think his approach to the game and the, and the way he kind of views his own development in you know kind of appreciates how it's happening in a in a kind of a holistic way where he's really just making sure that he can do everything it's like yeah he got beat by Chris Olave Chris Olave is supposed to beat DBs right I think he's, Chris Olave is going to beat a lot of DBs exactly this year. I don't want him to lose to Brian Edwards I don't want Jake yeah, Hayner fair. to beat him on third team reps <laughs> and that's where I want to see him get better and I think that play really kind of shows you who Alante Taylor is. Like, he could have gone over there and pouted. He didn't. He came back and he made a play, and he ended practice with that play. Uh, and that was Jay Kaner's only real chance to lead a two-minute drill in this minicamp. And I really like Alante Taylor. Me saying Paulson Adebo has a chance to be the starter is not saying I dislike Alante. I like Paulson, too. I like both of them. I think the Saints were in a really good position with their cornerback depth. As I said earlier, Jeff, it's a good problem to have. Like you're going to watch these two. It's like the the old age old adage of iron sharpens iron, so to speak. Like you're going to see these guys battling out to try and figure out who's going to be the cornerback two all all season long. I think it's going to make both of them better at the same time. Like you already know what you have in both these guys. Dennis Allen said it. They're both starters in this league. We just got to figure out which guy's going to be on the opposite side of our star cornerback, Marshawn Lattimore. But through their competition, that creates you know better players. Yes, and you can never have too many cornerbacks in this league. No. And you can definitely never have too many starting caliber cornerbacks, and the Saints have more than enough right now. It's a good problem to have, as I said. Sure is. All right, we're going to hit the break here. We're going to come back. We're going to hear an exclusive interview with new tight ends coach Clancy Barone, who knows a thing or two about coaching tight ends to the Pro Bowl. And we're back. Another segment here, and as mentioned in the open, this segment's going to focus on the tight end position. I was able to get an exclusive interview with Saints tight ends coach Clancy Barone. Gave a lot of insight into what's been going on in the tight end room. Talked about Juwan Johnson, talked about Taysom Hill, talked about everyone else, talked about his role, which I thought was really interesting in terms of guys worked with all these great tight ends over the years. And, you know, I think this is a pretty big hire for, for the Saints. You know, Dan Rochar has been here. I don't know if you necessarily got the development in that room that you would have hoped for. And Clancy just brings so much NFL 
just understanding. He's been a coach for 35 years. He just has so much knowledge in that brain. And I'm excited to see what he can do with this tight end group. So without further ado, here is that exclusive interview with Clancy Barone and a bit more breakdown between myself and Charlie Long on Sports Talk this week. Enjoy. You know, one of the understated moves of the Saints offseason is they moved on from tight ends coach and run game coordinator Dan Rochar. And Dan Rochar had been with the Saints for quite a long time. He started in 2013 as the running backs coach. He was the tight ends coach for a season, then spent a few years as the offensive line coach. Then in 2021, 2022, he shifted back to the tight ends coach role and he was the run game coordinator. This offseason, they brought in a guy I'd argue is kind of like tight end coach royalty. I think he is the only tight ends coach to lead four different tight ends to the Pro Bowl. He's been around forever. He coached Algie Crumpler. He coached Antonio Gates. He coached Kyle Rudolph. I'm missing one, but that's Clancy Barone. And I got a chance to talk to him this week, and I think he's excited about this tight end group. Um, One thing we talked about was, you know, he learns from his players as much as his players learn from him. And I thought it was was an interesting approach. And I think this is a room where you have a lot of guys who – didn't necessarily come up as tight ends. He's working with Jawan Johnson. He's working with Taysom Hill. And I think in an instructor, in a guy who has worked with these top flight tight ends and can can relay some of that wisdom of, okay, this is how Antonio Gates did it. This is how Algie Crumpler did it. Especially for a guy like Jawan Johnson, who's a wide receiver two years ago. And I thought he had a lot of interesting things to say. And so here is that exclusive interview with Saints tight ends coach Clancy Broome. So, you know, new team, obviously this is nothing new for you in terms of adapting to a new coaching staff, but what has been your kind of initial impression of the team you're joining, the coaching staff you're joining, you know, just kind of what's, how has that been so far? It's been, it's been flawless. It's been seamless. Uh, It's been a breath of fresh air. Number one is the, there's been a culture established here and it starts, it starts with ownership, goes down through the GM, through the head coach and everybody else all the way down the line. But there's a culture here where only the best is ever accepted. And, uh, I mean, how, how can you not love going to work at a place like that every day? And it, 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 it goes to the coaches, to the players, and just, just makes coming to work just that much more important and, and just that much more uh, enjoyable. And, and, and as a coach, because we hear that a lot, you know, so as a coach, how does that help kind of installing your new kind of philosophy into the tight end room when that culture is not something you have to establish yourself? It, well, it's number one is that, it, it makes it easier. Now you can you can certainly put your put your thumbprint on on your version of that culture and how you want to have that viewed by, by the players and so forth, um, whether it be through hard work or through the details of it all and so on and so forth. But to know that that ownership has your back, management has your back, head coach has your back, and everything else, whether it be uh, during the draft, during trying to go out and sign uh, top free agents, or, or or how we how we view our own players that are already on, on our roster, things like that. I just it's, they're, they're just one less hiccup along the way when you have everyone buying in and kind of pulling the rope in the same same direction. Gotcha. And, you know, this room is kind of interesting. It's I, I feel like it's an interesting mold of characters in that tight end room with Jawan, who came into the NFL as a wide receiver, Taysom, who is whatever you want to call him, and then obviously Foster coming in, Jesse. What what do you see from Jawan where you think, you know, he can expand his game even further from what he did last year? Well, number one is, is when you look at it these days, is that there's 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 very few true tight ends anymore in the NFL. Very few guys that start off their career in, in junior high as, as a tight end, became a tight end in high school, tight end in college. Most of them were quarterbacks that became tight ends, receivers that became tight ends, basketball players, right, who became tight ends. And that's kind of what I've been dealing with the last probably 15 years of my career are those guys that were something else and now they're tight ends. So you kind of been through that drill before and how to get them to acclimate to that position and what is required for that. I'll tell you the thing about uh, Juwan is he's very intelligent, very intelligent. The guy, the guy studies like crazy. He, he knows the offense as well as any coach knows it. Um, he certainly buys into to the grind of the job, if you will. And he's, you know, uh, during during the off season, constantly texting me about, hey, what 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 film can I watch? Who are some players I can study? This and that. Um, so the guy's a, a true football junkie, which makes my job easier because I'm also a football junkie. So we kind of see see the world through, through the same lens if you will and and that's kind of been been the same with all the guys in that room 
<laughs> who are some of the guys you, you suggested he study? Well, obviously there's uh, there's a lot of, of uh, slot receivers in the NFL that I think and, and, and it does not matter the position, but guys like Edelman, uh, people like that, that just have, have great route running ability. Um, there's guys like uh, Brandon Stokely, right? Local guy, you know, he's from, he's from uh, uh, Louisiana, who I worked with before, who's, who's a great inside route runner. Um, there's uh, uh, Antonio Gates, who's maybe one of the best route running tight ends to ever play the game. Uh, Gonzalez, people like that. Uh, Jimmy Graham, who's a different body type, but still a guy who, who has no fear when, it, when it's good for, you know, going up for the, for the football. So there's a, a number of players that you can watch and study for all different aspects of the game, be it for blocking, be it for route running, be it for finishing the plays, for scoring touchdowns, every little detail. There's there's someone that has done it better than anybody else, so why not study those guys? Yeah, and you, I think you in particular, you've obviously worked with all these all Pro Bowl, All Pro guys. Yeah. As you kind of go through your career and you, you coach an Antonio Gates, you coach an Algie Crumpler, is that a situation where you kind of pick up stuff from those players that you can then bring in? I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I have learned more from my players than they've ever learned from me. And I remember when I was with uh, Marty Schottenheimer, and I when I worked with Marty, and he, he told me something a little bit different. He says, he says you, you, you can't coach them all the same, Clance. You, you have to take what they do best and then, and then coach that to, to the best that they can possibly ever do it. So I, I, I couldn't coach Gates the way that I had coached Crumpler. They're two different skill sets. And at, at that point in my career, I didn't get it. And it's not until Marty talked to me about it that I realized, you know what, he's right. And since then, my, my career has blossomed since then, thanks to that little, little bit of advice in Marty's office one day. But yeah, so you know, in, in many ways, they're all different. Uh, in many ways, they're very much alike. Gotcha. And speaking of just kind of a unicorn in, in himself, Taysom Hill, obviously I know you haven't worked with him for very long, but what are your thoughts on his role as a tight end in this offense? Oh, I, think yeah. they can I think his role as a tight end is 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 limitless. And here's the thing, though. Yeah, we, we kind of learned this through COVID. You don't have to actually be in the building to attend meetings, mm-hmm. right? So even though he wasn't in the building during parts of, uh, of OTAs and so forth, he was still getting all of our information, all of our, all of our practice tapes, everything else on, on, on his iPad. We would uh, we would FaceTime with him from the tight end room to make sure he was still involved in that in, in that culture yeah. and in what we're doing. And it, it was it was fun to make sure that he's he's in, in the fold with us and talking nothing but but tight end play. And I don't know if you saw him practice yesterday, but he's and he's been out there really working. You can tell he's been working a lot of, on on his own with, with with the route running part of it. Um, obviously, reading coverages is not, is not new to him, but running routes off of certain leverage and things like that, which he's getting better at all the time. Today he ran a route that he had never run before, and he, and he wanted to come back and do it again. Hey, coach, give me, give me, that, give me that route again so I, can, so I can work on the top of the route. So things like that, another football junkie. But, um, yeah, his, his skill set uh, plays very well at that, that tight end position. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing a lot of, a lot of really fun things with him out there. Uh, and and, and let's, let's face it, he's, he's, not, he's not a small person by any stretch of the imagination. And in the old days, in the old Redskin era days, they, they would call him an, an H-back. He's a guy who can right. certainly line up and uh, block people. I have, I have no, no, no qualms about him lining up and, and blocking guys on the edge in the run game either. I think it was Jamal yesterday who called him a big buff gazelle. Just yeah, was a, there you go. Fair, yeah, fair very, 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 very fair assessment. Gotcha. Yeah, very well, fair. You know, before I let go, you know, how have you been acclimating to New Orleans so far? Obviously, it's a new place for you as well. I'll tell you what, I've been here for games, right, right, in the NFL. I've been here for games, so it's come in about 12 hours later, you're going to you know, tee the ball up and kick it off and see what happens. Um, haven't fared too well in the Dome over my career. There, have, had, had, had some good times, had some not so good times in the Dome, but I'll tell you what, uh, it's it's got a real small town feel. Now, now that I'm here, it's got a real small town feel, which totally caught me off guard. People are so friendly. My wife loves it here. I love it here. It's it's, it's been a blast. It really has been a blast. Gotcha. Any good food you've had so far? <laughs> too much. Just take a look at me. Too much good food. <laughs> That's, that's for damn sure. Yeah, Joe, I appreciate that. All right. Thank you so much. Again, that was tight ends coach Clancy Barone of the New Orleans Saints kind of breaking down what he's seen through the first few weeks of Saints practice heading into the 2023 season. And I thought one of the interesting things he said, actually, first, let me clean up. Julius Thomas was that fourth tight end that I could not recall earlier. So he is coach Algie Crumpler, Antonio Gates, Kyle Rudolph, and Julius Thomas to the Pro Bowl. Um, but one of the things that he said that I thought was interesting is he was giving Jawan Johnson players to study, and one of the players he gave him was Julian Edelman and Brandon Stokely. And I think that he makes a good point of like, yeah, the traditional idea of a tight end, you don't have to just 
be a tight end. You can do it a lot of different ways, and it doesn't have to even have to be a traditional tight end that you're studying. You just have to find ways to get open, and that's what he's kind of instilling in Juwan right now. Brandon Stokely, former Raging Cajun, yep. UL represent. No, absolutely. I think with what he was saying about how there's not very few like traditional tight ends anymore as well, I thought that was pretty interesting that – a lot of these tight ends are converts from different positions, whether that be wide receiver, whether that be former quarterbacks, just stuff like that. So Basketball players. Yeah, exact, exactly. So he's worked with players like Jawan before that may have not necessarily come into the NFL as a tight end, but have kind of developed that way. So it's not like he's working with anything new, which is a good sign for Saints fans. Yeah, and I think he, he had some interesting things to say about Taysom Hill and how he's kind of working this year. And I think yeah. the way he's lined up throughout camp, the way he's kind of worked around into multiple groups, I'm sure that is kind of a unique thing, even for someone who's coached in the NFL for 35 years, because I don't think there's another Taysom Hill in the NFL, at least not to the level that he does it. And he even Taysom said he doesn't really find out what he's going to be doing that day until the morning of practice, which is kind of fascinating, but he said he's okay with it. Well, that's kind of like the the million dollar question, so to speak, is how Taysom Hill is going to be utilized in the offense, because last season he wasn't really used much as a tight end. Like He was mm-hmm. still kind of the running quarterback, so to speak. But if he's got Clancy Barone, has his back, and wants to use him in different sets as a tight end, you may see him catching many more passes than he did this past season. So. Yeah, and, and that's what Taysom said when he was asked, like, where could his role potentially expand the most is as a receiver. He said receiver, realistically, it is as a pass-catching tight end, but we got to catch up with Taysom this week, and here's some of the thoughts he had on how his role could expand this year. Uh, it's been fun. Yeah, I, I don't really, you know, we have conversations and stuff with the coaches, but I'm kind of like, I, you know, show up and I just try to try to be ready for whatever it is. But it's good. I, I think we're trying to find this happy medium and happy balance of like, hey, let's let's be realistic with, with what we're going to ask you to do this season and make sure that you're getting the time and reps on on those things and man I thought the last three days has been really great um, from that standpoint and that communication between me and the staff and and what that is is, has been really good as well yeah I think this year is the first time that you know we've been able to go back and we've looked at you know 17 games and looked at rep count where that was and what I was being asked to do and so now we can take hey this is like the last 17 games and where your rep count was you know where you lined up and and now we can tailor that to you know what they're asking me to do on the practice field and then you know the the hope is is that we start to expand that you know and so as a starting point i think that's what we've done the last few days and we'll continue to have these conversations and push the envelope of you know hey maybe we do this or you know maybe we put you in this position and um you know i I think that's that's kind of where we're at right now so Taysom hill one of the questions that you pointed out is how is he going to be used this year and i think the bigger question is Not necessarily how is he going to be used, it's how are you preparing him for how he's going to be used? Because what's been different this year compared to last year is last year, not only did you convert him to tight end, you had him working at tight end all offseason, and then when the game started, you kind of changed that on the fly. He didn't really work at tight end, at least not in the traditional sense where he was going out and catching passes. He was lining up in the backfield, he was running, he was throwing, but where were all those reps in training camp? If if that's what you were going to have him do, why wasn't he getting those reps in training camp, and why wasn't he necessarily being put in the best position to succeed? Correct. And that's what you're changing. I think that's what you're hearing from Taysom. It's like, I don't mind doing whatever. You can have me, you can tell me that morning I'm working with the tight ends. You can tell me that morning I'm working with the running backs. You can tell me whatever. But when we get to the games, I need to be prepared and I need to have put in the work. And that's what you're focusing on this year. And I think, you know, that's where if you're Taysom, you're okay with doing anything, but you just don't want to be put in a position where you're going to look bad because you haven't had the prep time. Just having a more concrete plan for him for every single game this year. So yeah. that if, they, if you want to use him as a tight end all season long make sure that he's practicing and running routes and doing all the tight end stuff that he needs to do with Clancy Barone and the offensive staff but just no more of this kind of inconsistencies with what he's supposed to do on a given week they just have to let him know okay if we want to use you as a tight end we're going to use you as a tight end this week if we want to use you as the running quarterback this week we're going to use you out of that role just inconsistency is what really kind of held him back a lot of weeks he had some great weeks this past season but 
you know, coming into the season as a tight end, I think people had the expectations for him, and only getting nine catches last season, it's not what a lot of people expected when the role change happened. His role got way too predictable for how unpredictable of a role it should be. Right, like if you go back and you watch the Steelers game, you watch the 49ers game, like they stoned him. I think the Bucks in week two is another example. Like they knew what he was going to do and they stopped him because they were built to do that. Why do they know what he's going to do? Because you're not being creative enough with how he's with how he's being used. And I think making sure he is deployed as a pass catcher, he is deployed as a passing quarterback, he is deployed as a runner, makes it so you have to adjust and you can't ever feel like you're you're on the front foot. You are always on the back foot because he could be doing anything. Yeah, you have a Swiss Army knife. You got to get yeah. creative with him. Yeah, and also just congrats to Taysom Hill. He's had his second kid. That's part of the reason he was not around during OTAs. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, congrats. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure he and his wife are, are thrilled about that. And we're back. One more segment coming at you in this year's special edition of Inside Black and Gold. Just a reminder, we're going to get back into the normal publishing schedule. You'll get to hear another voice on here that is not mine coming up. Steve Geller has been on vacation, but he will return and have some takes. So you just don't have to hear me preaching to you every episode. But for this segment, I'm going to get into a little bit more content. We would typically have this at the top of the episode, but because of how it all worked out, I felt like we wanted to get into the sports talk version first, and we're going to have a bit more of that in the back end of this segment, get into the running back battle. We talked to Jamal Williams. He had some really kind of interesting quotes about Alvin Kamara and such, but let's just kind of, kind of clear the decks here on the final two days of minicamp. Obviously, the first episode last week was breaking down the first day, so I'm not going to get too much into that. But, you know, there were some interesting things that came out, one being Dennis Allen kind of talked about the health of that group, of the entire roster. He said that only one player would be listed as questionable for the start of training camp. I tweeted that out, and there was immediately a lot of guesses as to who that might be. I don't think it's Michael Thomas. It could be Trevor Penning. He and Cesar Ruiz both had hardware removed from their feet to repair that Liz Frank injury that they suffered late in the season. So I don't think it's either of them either. You know, it could be Penning because I think he's probably a few weeks behind Caesar in terms of the rehab. But but if they had the hardware removed at the same time, that would indicate to me that they're on the same kind of general schedule. Now, Caesar was not out there this week. He was out there at all three OTA sessions. He was not this week for just kind of viewing, right? He wasn't supposed to work out, but Trevor Penning, Nick Saldaveri were both out there. So it makes you wonder if there was some sort of re-aggravation. I don't know. There hasn't been any indication of that. So I would guess it's not either of them. I don't think it's Mike Thomas either. We've seen him kind of progressively get a bit more involved in terms of he's been working off to the side with Derek Carr for small portions of each of these practices. And on fr- on Thursday, the final day of practice, I thought he was moving really well. If he had had any kind of setback, which there would have to be for him not to be ready for training camp, because that's what we've heard all along, is that he is going to be expected to go on day one of training camp. If there was a setback, I don't think he would be out there working with Derek Carr at this point. So I don't think it's Mike Thomas. My guess, and this is just a guess, but I think I'm right, is that the player that would not be ready is probably Anthony Johnson, the defensive back, who we have not seen in terms of being on the field throughout the entire minicamp right so and if that's the case then for a guy that if if the only player that is questionable is the depth defensive back that no one really knows about I think that's probably a win the other two players that will be worth watching although it's been said to be minor Rashid Shahid, Chris Olave. Rashid Shahid was not out there any of the three days For practice, he's dealing with a groin injury. It's said to be minor. He's been in the locker room. We've talked to him. Does not seem major whatsoever, so I don't think it's him. And then Chris Olave is dealing with what Dennis Allen described as minor Achilles inflammation. He was out there watching practice, not in uniform. He was wearing a hoodie. I don't think that his absence is anything to be super concerned about. Cam Jordan also missed a couple days of practice with a minor heel issue. According to Jeff Duncan, he was out there on Thursday. He's going to be fine. So all in all, I think that is a very clean bill of health. Even if there is one player, if it does end up being Trevor Penning, who's just a few days behind in his rehab or Cesar Ruiz, one way or another, I think you're feeling comfortable 
there. Another thing worth noting, and we did talk about this in the opening segment of the Sports Talk portion of the program, is the Saints did sign three players. They signed Billy Price, who is an interior lineman, primarily a center, but he has played all three interior line spots in his time with the Bengals. He was the 21st overall pick way back, I want to say, in the 2017 draft. And, you know, it's just more depth at a premium position. I think this Saints team loves guys who can go from guard to center, can play either guard spot. I don't know what he's looking at in terms of prospects to make the roster, but considering Nick Saldaveri has been kind of a no-go, a non-starter in these practices, and I don't know how long the calf injury is expected to keep him out. I think that's good depth. They also signed Kiki Kuti and Lynn Bowden Jr. They cut Malik Flowers, kick return specialist, and running back Sir Roderick Thompson. Malik Flowers is a bit of a surprise, but I think when all is said and done, you're signing Kiki Kuti and Lynn Bowden, and you are cutting Malik Flowers because you are looking to find your stable backup kick returner and I'm just have to guess that Malik did not do enough was not consistent enough in the return part of the game to justify a roster spot and you know when you look back at what happened these these roster moves were announced after the final practice and when you look back at how things developed in those practices you probably could have guessed this was coming even though it's a bit of a surprise because I think Malik Flowers has looked solid in team drills they were giving Kiki Huti and Lynn Bowden virtually all of the, the return reps, right? And Malik Flowers is not here to be a receiver. He is here to be a return specialist behind Rashid Shahid if he makes this team, makes this roster. And him not getting those reps is a pretty good indicator that they were kind of out on him to some extent. So I think when you're looking at one of these guys, I think he, one of Kiki Kuti, when Bowden has a really good chance to make this roster, whoever kind of stands out in the return game and is stable, right? You want that backup returner to not necessarily be dynamic, but you have to trust them, right? Because we've talked about the new kickoff rules that allow you to fair catch the ball. Basically, the only way you can get that wrong is by muffing a fair catch because you cannot pick that up and advance it if you muff it. If you muff that at the one, even if you recover it, you're getting that ball at the one. So to me, I think that's probably what ended... Malik's run on the roster in terms of maybe he muffed a couple kicks. I don't know. Either way, I, I think Kiki Kuti is probably the best guess. Lynn Bowden is an interesting guy as well. Either way, those guys are on the roster. Malik Flowers, Sir Roderick Thompson are off the roster. One thing I did not get to talk about in the first episode of last week that really kind of developed and I think is something to watch going into camp. I talked about the CB2 matchup in terms of Paulson and Debo and Alante Taylor. It's going to be intriguing. The next question is, do you have enough at linebacker without making any significant moves or roster changes going into training camp, going into the regular season? I think that this team is hopeful that they do. They did not sign anybody. They did not draft anybody. DeMarco Jackson was a fifth round pick from last year. I think this team wants to get a good long look at him. He's been working at the mic, and I think that's where you're going to see him play. I think you're going to see him kind of shadow DeMario Davis. And I've talked about this in the past. I like the concept of teams using what I would call, this is my term, not the team's, pipeline positions, right? Like I want to see the Saints bring in somebody that they like and let him shadow DeMario Davis so that when DeMario Davis does inevitably retire, you have a guy who has been studying at his feet, has been learning everything he could possibly learn from DeMario Davis so that he has a much better chance to succeed when he does get an opportunity to take over, right? You saw this with Caden Ellis. I think Caden Ellis is a different player today than he would have been if he was not able to study and learn from DeMario Davis, and it turned it into a very lucrative contract with the Atlanta Falcons. So I think the Saints want to get that chance with DeMarco Jackson, but my question is, who's backing up Pete Werner? Because I don't think your backup Mike linebacker is your backup Will linebacker. I think you need someone who can cover, Right, I'm okay at the Sam position. You barely use it, and Zach Bond's going to be fine. That's a position you use in run support. That's a position you use to rush the passer in your kind of heavy defensive formations. I am not concerned about who's going to back up Zach Bond. I'm not concerned about who's going to start there. I feel okay with it. My question is, who is going to back up Pete Werner? And right now, is it Nephi Sewell? Is it Andrew Dowell? Is it Anthony Orgy? Is it Nick Anderson? I don't know, but I have not seen enough 
from any depth linebacker to say, yeah, we're good. We don't need to do anything there. Hmm. You know, on, on the final practice, I actually thought you saw a bit more out of them. I spoke previously about Nick Anderson after OTAs. I think he has been struggling a bit more than you would hope to see in coverage. And I only say that, I think I'm holding him to a higher standard there because he doesn't have the size to be able to hold up as a traditional NFL linebacker. He's got to be almost like a hybrid safety, like a Mark Barron type, even a Landon Collins, who is almost like a, a box safety slash linebacker who you no can hold up in coverage and can also go up and lay the wood on somebody because he is that linebacker build, even if he's a little smaller. But he just hasn't done enough. He did have a, a solid pass breakup on an Alvin Kamara route in the final day of team drills. Cool. Anthony Orgy is a guy I like. He's not a cover linebacker, but he did have some nice moments. He shadowed Brian Edwards to the edge of the field, broke up a pass in team drills. He's been getting the second team linebacker reps. So I think if you're picking somebody right now who has a chance to make this roster, it's it's Orgy. It's a, and it's a guy I, I liked going into OTAs in minicamp. Still a guy I like, although... I've kind of talked myself into thinking if there's a depth linebacker, if there's a veteran that is available or becomes available that you want to bring in to really push those guys and have a chance to make the roster, I, I think you're going to you're gonna look long and hard. Maybe a Zach Cunningham, I don't know. I haven't really had a chance to go through that depth. But one way or another, I think linebacker is a position that if you're, if you're looking at any group and saying we probably could make some moves there, make a depth signing, that's probably it. Beyond that, you know, the big takeaway from from minicamp for me, Derek Carr looks every bit like the real deal. I think this team is optimistic. I think there's a lot of really good chemistry going on. And I'm excited to watch what they have in training camp. I'm excited to go into the regular season. I'm cautiously optimistic that this is going to be the turnaround year for this team and kind of a palate cleanser, I think, is a good way to describe it from the Breeze era where you just haven't, you just want to see them Put a, put a product on the field that gives you confidence that this team can turn back the clock and, and recapture some of that magic from the Sean Payton, Drew Brees era. Because if you can't, then you really probably have to tear it down and start from scratch. And that's just, ugh, I don't want to have to do that. I don't have to deal with that. Saints fans don't want to have to deal with that. The team doesn't want to have to deal with that. It would be much nicer if you could kind of reset and rebuild while being competitive. And that's what a successful Derek Carr would allow you to do. So that's what I'm hoping for. But without further ado, let's get into that final segment between myself and Charlie. We dive into the running back equation and more specifically Jamal Williams and Kendra Miller and how they have how they could be deployed to fill that gap right between Alvin Kamara and everybody else. And what happens when Alvin Kamara gets suspended? If and when he gets suspended, it feels more like a when than an if. Can Jamal Williams fill that gap? I'm hopeful. But here is that clip between myself and Charlie. Enjoy. Oh, this little boy is like a, how can I put it? Like a spark plug. He just, that boy just, just get loose so fast. His acceleration is just crazy. Like he just be chilling and then he, he just turn it on. It's just so funny. I, like, I just love the way he run. It's just so effortless and just, it's just him. So, you know, but me is, oh, you can tell. I'm, if you, if you look at my faces, oh yeah, I'm putting as much effort as I can. I'm not a cool looking person. I'm all grit and effort and as ugly as it can get at running back. That's me right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was New Saints running back Jamal Williams talking about the difference between himself and Alvin Kamara. I'm Jeff Nowak. He's Charlie Long. And, uh, Charlie, what do you think when you hear that answer? <laughs> he's going to be a fan favorite here. <laughs> like he is so fun and just just from hearing him, he's so personable and just cr- like I don't know. He's he's one of a kind. But as far as his comparison with Alvin and everything, it's like a sports car. I think that's yeah. I think that's kind of what he was getting at. He's Alvin Kamara on the field. It's just a high energy like sports car that will go as fast as possible with as little effort as possible. Alvin Kamara is like a Formula One car. Yeah, Jamal Williams is like a like a like a muscle car, like a tank. Like yeah. you can hear it. He's gonna go fast, but you're gonna you're, it's gonna shake while it's happening. <laughs> and I think it's a good it's an apt description because that is true. Like Alvin Kamara, if you had to pick one word to describe his play style, it's smooth. 
right? Like you don't even realize how fast he's going and how quick he's getting in and out of his cuts because he just it's effortless. And then you see Jamal and it's like, yeah, he, you could tell he's working hard. He might he's gonna run through you, but he's gonna be huffing and puffing while he does it. Um, and I just I really enjoyed that. I really enjoy watching Jamal and. You know, he's going to have a big role because I'm pretty sure Alvin's going to get suspended at some point this season. I don't even think and that's a question at this point, Jeff. It's really just a question of when. and When and how so long. Can Jamal Williams shoulder that load? We haven't really seen anything from Kendra Miller yet. Obviously, mm-hmm. he's going to have a lot of expectations. Third round pick. You know, you, you don't spend that pick if you don't really like him as a Especially prospect. Especially the Saints. The Saints don't really like spending top three round draft picks on running back so they yeah. obviously really really like the guy i mean we right. talked about that when they picked them months ago but yeah kendry's probably going to be a feature back in the offense as well with jamal but having a bruising guy like jamal williams that you can really count on because i mean last year it, when it was like those third and shorts there was a lot of reliance on Taysom hill to get it done but having a guy like jamal williams that notoriously got it done last year with the lions I mean, what did he have? Seventeen touchdowns. He did. Uh, he set a he set a record. He broke Barry Sanders' record, actually. But I guess my question: I know it, that he can be that bruising power runner. The question I have is: Can he be the early downs runner? Because that's what you're going to need him to do when if Alvin is out, right? right? Like you do have Taysom. You can rely on Taysom in short yardage. But the question is going to be: Who catches the ball out of the backfield? And I know Jamal can catch the ball, but yes. last year he only had I think twelve receptions on 16 targets yeah with the Lions I, I think that was actually kind of I don't I don't even really understand why he did that because he showed that he could catch in Green Bay yeah he had 39 catches one year I think he had five touchdowns he can catch um it's never been a huge part of his game but he can do it and I think that's going to be something that we will want to see develop with him and Carr um you know it, I think the difference is you know Alvin catches like a wide receiver Right, Jamal catches like a running back, and there's a difference, right? Like you're you're kind of battling the ball and just trying to make sure you don't drop it, whereas Alvin's trying to catch and run. And I think his ability to do that is going to be a very big factor in how much of a struggle those six, eight games are. Because if you suddenly lose your your running back receiving game while Alvin's out, eh, that's going to really hamper a lot of things you try to do on offense. Yeah, absolutely. But I at the same time. I'm not entirely worried about Jamal's catching abilities because, as you know, we mentioned, he did it in Green Bay. He's just got to be asked to do it. He wasn't asked to do it in Detroit because I, I think that DeAndre Swift was more of the catching back yeah. in that scheme where he was, you know, he played the bruiser role. He was the, the red zone guy, the goal line guy, the short yardage guy. I think he might have a slightly different role with the Saints, especially with Kamara out, as we were kind of talking about. Yeah, I think, I guess, I guess ability is one thing and. Trust is the other thing. Like, do you trust him in those moments on a third down where you need to pick up five yards on a swing route? Do you trust him to just throw the ball out there? He's going to catch it. He's going to go get those yards. I think you trust him to make break a tackle. Do you trust him to catch it and, and not put the ball on the ground? That's the question. And it's not about whether I trust him. It's about where D- Derek Carr trusts him in those moments. So, yeah, and the coaching staff trusts him to put him in that position as well. Exactly. And those are going to be the questions we answer during training camp. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this special edition of Inside Black and Gold. Thanks for everyone who listened. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. Leave a rating, leave a review. Again, I apologize to anyone who was looking for an episode on Friday. Just was not in the car. It's been kind of a crazy week. But we should get back more to the regular schedule. Steve Gell is back from vacation, so we should hear his dulcet tones on the next episode of this podcast, which I expect to publish Wednesday, most likely. Steve wasn't out there at minicamp, so I need to give him a little bit of time to to reset and kind of catch up. Um, but we should have an episode Wednesday, Friday, and then get back to the normal two-episode-a-week schedule. But I did want to give everyone this kind of catch-up podcast. Hopefully, you're able to get something out of it. And I'm looking forward to this season. This was kind of a, a trial run, kind of a dry run to get us amped up for the full training camp. It's going to start at the end of July. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully we can continue to build up this podcast. So if you know anyone who's looking for a new Saints podcast, who's really into the Saints, or you know just wants to kind of get some more information about the Saints, please pass along. Give us, give us a recommend. Recommend us. How do you say that? You got it. Because everyone I've talked to about this podcast seems to enjoy it. It's really just a matter of getting it in front of people because I think that we're doing a decent job here. I think there's a product here that, that we can continue to build on. So if you want to hear something, if there's something you want us to get into, especially over the next month when we're going to be scraping the bottom of the barrel for some content with the team out of town for the next six weeks hit me up on twitter at jeff underscore nowak make sure to subscribe on youtube at wwl sports and keep it locked on inside black and gold rating coming back later in the week with 
my updated 53-man roster projection after minicamp. Going to definitely be some changes on there, although not a ton. Either way, we'll break it down. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Hoot at. Happy Father's Day. And be easy, y'all. Peace.